Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. Today on the Feast of the Archangels, we're going to begin looking at the spiritual works of mercy. The first one is going by the numbering according to the compendium of the Catechism is to counsel the doubtful. St. Paul asks rhetorically in Romans 11:34, Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? God really is the only one who doesn't need counsel. All the rest of us do. Counseling the doubtful means giving people advice about spiritual things and giving advice to those who are unsure of God's will for them. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Without counsel, plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. And Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 echoes that saying, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. St. Francis at one point in his life was unsure if he should just spend all of his time in prayer or if the Lord wanted him to preach as well. He asked St. Clair and one or two of the friars to pray about this and asked the Lord what he wanted Francis to do. When they did this, it was revealed to them all that St. Francis should also preach, not just pray. And here we see the humility of St. Francis, too. He probably was the closest person to God on earth in his time, and yet he sought out advice about what to do. Asking for guidance or advice is a sign of humility. At times, perhaps many times, God gives us one piece of the puzzle. He gives another piece to someone else. So to seek out, too, and be open to receiving advice and guidance is a sign that we're not wise in our own eyes. It's a sign that we have a teachable spirit, and that's good. To give the right advice or to give good advice is itself a work of mercy. One of the titles of our Lord is that He is the Wonderful Counselor. Isaiah prophesied about Christ, saying, To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verse 6. And the Wonderful Counselor who is Jesus Christ, the second person, the Blessed Trinity. He calls the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Counselor as well. I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another Counselor with a capital C to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things, Jesus says at John 14, verses 16, 17, and 26. So when we give good spiritual advice to others, we're actually sharing in, we're participating in the work of God himself. Sometimes people have doubts about moral questions. Is this or this, this type or that type of activity sinful? Sometimes they have doubts about questions regarding discernment. You know, how do I discern God's will or how do I know what's the best choice to make? Sometimes doubts about, arise about whether or not God is really working in our life or about how he's working. And God doesn't give us those answers directly and immediately. He wants us again to seek out wise counsel. Jesus says, seek and you will find, Matthew 7, verse 7. And we know at times people just come to us with their problems and they're not seeking any spiritual advice at all, right? And sometimes the wisest thing we can do to them is say, well, I think you really need God in your life. Or I think you need to get back to the sacraments. Or, have you prayed about this? Do you pray the rosary? Sometimes just simple spiritual advice along those lines goes a long, long way. You'd be surprised how, well it, how, how important that kind of advice is. Two recent examples of bad counsel, which we'll mention today. I watched a few minutes of Lila Rose's interview uh, on the Dr. Phil show regarding abortion and Dr. Phil was sadly and ironically, actually in an authoritative manner, he was affirming that, he said, the scientific community is not in agreement about when life begins. It was ironic because when somebody 
sci quotes the scientific community as the authority as if there's no higher authority than them, one. But also, two, that's saying that they're ignorant about something. So if you're quoting an authority, you're assuming you're going to quote something that they actually said, which is true, but he's saying that he's, they're ignorant about this. So it's kind of ironic that they're being authoritative and quoting them. And then he looked at his audience, and what does he say? He said, it's up for you to decide the truth. That's basically what he said. That's really, really bad counsel. But that's radical subjectivism, too. It's I decide what's right and wrong. I decide what's human life and what isn't. It's akin to the reasoning of the pro-slavery movement before the Civil War. It's the thinking of the pro-abortion movement nowadays. It's what the devil thinks as well, too. I decide what's right and what's wrong. I decide who's a human being and who isn't. I decide when life begins and who has a life that's worth living. Anyway, Dr. Phil was saying, the scientific community doesn't know when life begins, which isn't true. So when there's doubt and you don't know if something's a human life, therefore it's okay to kill it. Fifth commandment is you shall not kill, you shall not murder. The problem here with people is, like this is not that they're doubtful about the truth, but that they really don't have a heart for the truth. And along those lines, notice that the spiritual work of mercy is to counsel the doubtful, not to counsel the deaf. Right? Some people don't have ears to hear the truth. They have ears to hear only what they want to hear. In the past few years, in a different extreme, there's been a greater SSPX infiltration into the church. Brings us to the second example of bad counsel, which we'll share. It comes from a cleric in a far away country via two media outlets, one of which has a reputation for really distorting things. They're very good at that. In this brief video, we hear that the SSPX is, quote, not formally excommunicated that they're, quote, in the church, that they're, quote, keeping the faith, that they've had, quote, some faculties granted to them, that they're, quote, simply doing what the saints always did, and that their ministry is basically legitimate because there is, quote, an emergency of faith. First of all, just be aware that these are essentially the talking points of the SSPX. So the conclusion is that it's acceptable to attend their services. That's very, very dangerous counsel, not just bad counsel. The apologist John Salza did a good job, I think, in responding to these points. We'll just talk about a couple of them or a few of them. First of all, it said that the SSPX are not formally excommunicated. Well, that's true, but by now neither are the Orthodox. Their formal excommunication was lifted by Paul VI. So they're not declared schismatics, but they're still undeclared schismatics. Going back to Dr. Phil's show for a second, Catholics who have abortions are not formally excommunicated from the church either, but the sin of abortion carries with it what's called a latte sententiae excommunication. That means automatic but it's not declared. In his apostolic letter, Ecclesia Dei, also called Ecclesia Dei Ad Flicta, promulgated by John Paul II in 1988 after Lefebvre's illicit consecration of bishops, the Holy Father said at one point in this letter, and maybe we should all read this letter, it might be helpful. He says, quote, in the present circumstances, I wish especially to make an appeal both solemn and heartfelt, both paternal and fraternal, to all those who until now have been linked in various ways to the movement of Archbishop Lefebvre, that they may, be fully, that they may fulfill the grave duty of remaining united to the Vicar of Christ in the unity of the Catholic Church, and, he says, of ceasing their support in any way for that movement. Everyone should be aware, said the Holy Father, that formal adherence to the schism is a grave offense against God and carries the penalty of excommunication decreed by canon law, unquote. Pope John Paul II says that anyone who formally adheres to the SSPX schism is excommunicated. Does this sound like a movement that we should be part of? 
Again, it's not a declared excommunication, it's automatic, it's late sententiae, is the Latin phrase. It was also affirmed in this recent video that the SSPX are in the church. That's a deceptive affirmation because technically speaking, any individual who's validly baptized is in the church. There's only one church. If you're validly baptized, you're in it. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, SSPX, Sede Vacantis. Now, whether you're in full communion with the church, whether you're in heresy or in schism, that's a separate question. But the society itself is not in the church because it has no canonical status. The church doesn't recognize it as an organization that's part of the church. They're an organization outside of the church, the Catholic Church. In May of 2021, Cardinal Burke said that the SSPX is not part of the one Roman Catholic Church throughout the world. Why? Essentially because they're not subject to the governance of the church. To be subject to the church's governance is part of divine law. It's mandated by Christ himself. It's not optional. So to say that they're in the church, it's not accurate. It was also stated that the SSPX is, quote, keeping the faith. Pope Benedict XVI, when he lifted the excommunication of the four bishops in 2009, he said that the fact that the SSPX doesn't have canonical status is based on doctrinal, not disciplinary reasons. That means that they're not keeping the faith. If you've got doctrinal problems, you're not keeping the faith. In fact, the SSPX rejects John Paul II's 1989 profession of faith. It's actually heretical to do that. So they may be keeping a type of faith, they may be keeping many articles of the faith, but they are not keeping the faith. It's also said that since they had some faculties granted to them, hearing confessions, witnessing to marriages, the conclusion is therefore their ministry is legitimate and therefore they're in the church. Well, canon law says that the Orthodox validly administer the sacrament of penance as well. So just because some priests validly administer sacraments doesn't mean that you can jump to the conclusion that I can attend their services, that their ministry is legitimate, and therefore they're in the church. Pope Benedict XVI again in that letter to the bishops in 2009 said this, quote, in order to make this clear once again, until the doctrinal questions meeting problems, are clarified the society has no canonical status in the church and its ministers even though they have been freed of the ecclesiastical penalty do not legitimately exercise any ministry in the church." Unquote. It was also affirmed in this video that the SSPX is simply continuing to do what the saints always did. I'll just quote John Salsa's response to that. I think it speaks for itself. He asks rhetorically, he says this, what saint completely withdrew submission from two popes and ignored all other canonical warnings, suppressions, and censures? What saint repeatedly ordained priests for years against the will of the Holy See and then sent them into the diocese without lawful incarnation? What saint consecrated bishops against the express canonical warning of the Roman pontiff? What saint took a sickle to his brother bishop's diocese by preaching against them and administering confirmations, which Lefebvre did and his bishops do now? What saint publicly promoted hostility to the Pope and the Holy See, calling the Roman Catholic Church a false, counterfeit, conciliar, modernist, Protestant church who is no longer Catholic? What saint publicly propagated false doctrines which the society does, i.e. regarding the church's teaching on the episcopacy, episcopacy, rejecting that, rejecting the church's profession of faith, teaching false doctrines on sacramental attention and supply jurisdiction. What saint founded a substitute ecclesiastical tribunal to perform acts reserved to the local ordinary or to the Holy See? What saint promotes the erection of chapels and seminaries and schools without ecclesiastical permission? The answer is none of them. None of the saints do these things. 
regarding the statement about the emergency of faith. We commented on that a few days ago. Emergency of faith is very, very easily used to justify whatever you want to do. It's essentially what led Archbishop Lefebvre to do what he did, sinfully consecrating four bishops. It's what led Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers to do what they did. They said there was an emergency of faith. So people complain about Pope Francis sowing seeds of confusion, but then they turn around and they do the exact same thing themselves. As we've noted before, an auxiliary bishop in a faraway country doesn't have any authority to say you can frequent those places. The Pope has universal authority and jurisdiction. Your local bishop has authority and jurisdiction over you. An auxiliary bishop in a faraway country doesn't. He's not even in charge of his own diocese. The Archbishop here in Indianapolis, reiterating the previous Archbishop's teaching, said it's sinful to attend Masses celebrated by an SSPX priest. And if in these things you reject the Church's authority and jurisdiction and governance and counsel for that matter, well, welcome back to Protestantism. <clears throat> welcome, basically, to the Orthodox Church's position on things. So sometimes we have ears, but the counsel we're looking for is only what we want to hear. And we're actually gambling with our eternal salvation with these things. It's not a game. That's how serious it is. You're gambling with your eternal salvation associating with these groups. The words of our Lord come to mind here. He says in Matthew 18, 17, if your brother refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. Essentially, he's saying don't associate with those people. And in many cases, Probably better not to, especially if they're hook, line, and sinker in the grip of these schismatic groups. St. Augustine interprets those words of our Lord to mean don't consider them now in the number of your brothers, yet constantly pray for their salvation, says the doctor of grace. So there's bad counsel from the left. We know about that a lot. There's also bad counsel from the right. In our next reflection, we'll speak briefly about the two things that are really needed. We need to have if we're going to give good counsel to the doubtful, to doubtful hearts and doubtful minds. So let's ask Our Lady for the grace to receive and to give good counsel. And for the grace and for the wisdom to avoid bad counsel too. And on this feast day, let's ask St. Raphael to heal all sins against life, all sins against the church. Let's also ask St. Michael to defend us from the snares of the enemy. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.